Hey folks, I'm back with uh, my third video on how I got the IM title. Uh, in this video I'll be talking about how I got my final norm. Um, so I actually got the last norm at the 2016 St. Louis Autumn Invitational. Uh, this was a round robin tournament held at the St. Louis Chess Club, uh, and that took place in November of 2016. Uh, if you guys remember from the previous videos, I got my first norm in uh, 2014 at the Spice Cup. I got my second one in 2015 at the very end at the North American Open. Uh, and then my third norm came at the towards the end of 2016. So definitely had a little bit of space uh, between the norms. Um, but before showing some of the critical games from that tournament, I wanted to first show a couple of examples where um, I actually had a chance to get that final norm, um, but I actually failed. Um, because of course my final tournament where I got it, you know, that one obviously ended successfully, um, but it's not like it was such an easy path and it was definitely paved with a couple of failures along the way. Um, so this game took place at the uh, 2016 Gibraltar Chess uh, Festival. Uh, Gibraltar is one of the strongest open tournaments all year. It's one of my favorite events to play. Uh, this was my first time playing yet, and I've since played uh, just once. And um, uh, well, I was actually doing pretty well in this tournament. In fact, so well that during the tournament, my rating had crossed uh, the 2400 threshold uh, in terms of the live rating. Um, and I actually, my rating going into the event was 2360, but I had to do some math because this was actually the first tournament I played, I think one of the first, um, after the North American Open, and uh, that tournament hadn't been officially rated yet, but my live rating was something around 2385 or 87 or so, and in the process of this tournament, as I was doing well, um, I had gained enough points to cross 2400. Uh, and that's very important because, of course, in addition to the three norms, your rating has to cross 2400 at least once. Um, but what many people don't know is that you can cross it during a tournament because FIDE can just calculate how many points you're going to get after every game. So if you win a game, you get six points and you cross 2400. Uh, basically, that's it. That that counts for, for uh, crossing uh, the rating threshold. And for me, this was actually pretty useful because... Um, I did not do well in this game. I ended up losing this game, and then I lost the final round as well in round 10, and those losses actually put my rating back under 2400, and I didn't cross 2400 for, for quite some time after that. Uh, so it was pretty important for me to at least jump over one time, just get that achievement, and then, and then that was it. Uh, so yeah, for this game, this was... Uh, in round nine, and uh, I basically just needed a draw in this game to to get the the final norm, uh, as well as just clinching the title. Uh, I was playing against uh, WGM Tan Zhang Yi from China. Um, she was a WGM at the time, but her feeder rating was over 2,500, so she was essentially a grandmaster strength player, and I believe she got her grandmaster title not long after this. Um, and I'm starting with this position because the, the game had actually gone pretty reasonably for me. It was a King's Indian. We ended up in this end game where Black had really no issues. And if anything, I thought that Black might be slightly better here thanks to the, the power of the bishop pair. In particular, the, the light squared bishop was, uh, was a pretty good piece in this position. Um, but you guys will see that my, my mindset for playing this position out was really not in the right place because uh, I felt like I'm at least equal here. And instead of just trying to make good moves, for example, like g5, just pushing a little bit on the king side, um, I played the move bishop to c4. And uh, I expected my opponent to, to play knight b2, and this is what happened. Uh, and then I played bishop e6, and essentially offering a draw um, by, by repetition. If white goes knight d3, I'll go bishop c4, and, and the game will be uh, over. Uh, objectively, this is fine, but you can already see that my brain was probably not in the right place. I was just trying to make a draw, and uh, this is usually not the right approach um, because it, it's just going to distract you from the game. You're not going to be as objective. At this point, I should have just played like bishop f1 or something, just trying to keep the bishop active. I mean, it's not like my position is even that bad after bishop e6, but it, it was kind of the start of a, a downswing. Um, so white, of course, just goes king d3. She's just improving her position. Um, there's no reason that white needs to acquiesce to a draw. Objectively, the position is, is pretty balanced, and white has this advantage on the queen side and is certainly uh, justified in, in playing for, for a win with ideas like knight c4, knight d6. Um, so the game continued. Knight c4, knight e8, uh, knight d6 was played. Uh, I'm forced to trade knights, and, and now white gets this pretty strong pass deep on. Um, objectively, I think black is still okay. Um, the game continued a4. Bishop f1 check, king d2. I start bringing in my king. Now white played b5. And uh, here is where I kind of start to go wrong even more. Uh, I decided to play c takes b5. 
Um, I think a much better move was c5, and then after something like knight d5, h5, just so the, the pawn is not hanging on h6. Uh, I think black is basically okay. I mean, it's not a fun position because this pawn is quite strong, but I'll put my bishop back on h3, the pawn will be under control, and objectively white doesn't really have that much here. What I did instead was I played c takes b5, uh, knight takes b5, and then I gave up the bishop, um, essentially just trying to force a draw in this position. I figured, well, if my king can just... Um, pick up the d-pawn, then I'm just going to have zero problems and, and, and a draw will be made. Um, but of course things are not so simple, and here white played uh, f4. And uh, now I realize that when I play king f7, white is going to play f5. And then after takes, takes, I can't use the e6 square, I have to go king e8 if I want to pick up the pawn. Otherwise white's king is just going to walk in on the light squares and, uh, and, and my position will be lost. And here I was very afraid of the move h4 where after king d7, g4, white creates the second pass pawn. My bishop can't deal with the h pawn, so h, uh, if I take, then g takes h5. If I take on g4, this uh, this pawn just starts running. So I think I, I need to take here, then g takes h5, um, king e7. And I was calculating this position, and I realized, okay, my king is in the square of the pawn, so the pawn itself is not going to promote. But what I didn't like was the fact that after, let's say, h6, king f7, this pawn, of course, is untouchable in h6. My king is going to have to be super passive. The bishop on d8 is already passive. And white is ready to just walk in with the king towards the queen side, pick up the a pawn, pick up the b6 pawn. And I just didn't see how black was going to be uh, able to defend this position. So objectively, it actually turns out to be a draw um, just based on one very specific resource, uh, king e4 bishop e7, and as soon as white plays king d5, black has to go bishop c5 here. And uh, then if white trades bishops, I'm going to have this uh, protected pass pawn on e5, and that's not going to be good for white. Um, so white has to kind of sidestep. I can go bishop f2, and now that my bishop is more active, black is basically holding. Um, white's king cannot leave the e-pawn anymore, as I'm just going to play e4 and e3. So objectively, this position was still drawn, but you can see how difficult of a line I would have to find uh, so to me, that just means that this decision to take on b5 here, this was just not a practical decision because it leads to an endgame where finding the only defense is quite difficult. Um, in the game, what had happened was after f4, I decided to take on f4. This was probably the losing move. And then after g takes f4, f5, I simply didn't want to allow white to push f5, so I did it myself. But then after e5, these pawns were just way too strong. My bishop on d8 was uh, completely dominated, and uh, the end game was actually just hopeless. Uh, the key idea I just didn't estimate properly was after king f7, uh, bishop f2, very, very strong move. Uh, my bishop on d8 just has no moves. And that means that white is going to bring the king to c4. I'll put my king on e6. But then eventually I'm just going to run into Zugzwang because my bishop has no moves. My king will have to move out of the way. White's king comes in and, and game over. So this is the idea I kind of underestimated. I thought I'm holding some kind of blockade here, um, but it, it simply falls short. Um, so I ended up losing this game. That was uh, a pretty painful experience because I felt like I just had a great position. And then I started playing for a draw and messed everything up. I then got another chance um, to get the final IM norm uh, several months later. This took place at the 2016 uh, Isle of Man International. Um, this is another tournament where I was doing uh, reasonably well. And um, this was, uh, again, round nine of the tournament. I think this was just a nine round tournament, so this was the final round. And uh, I needed to draw in this last game against Grandmaster uh, Babu Lalith. Um, which uh, was definitely a good good result for me, like playing white, you know, normally you should be able to, to make a draw. Um, but the opening didn't really work out in my favor. Um, we ended up playing a Cambridge Springs variation here with queen to a5, and the line I went for uh, was not really conducive to, let's say, keeping it solid. Um, as in these lines, white is often um, sacrificing a pawn. And here, okay, I felt like I, I have to sacrifice a pawn. This is the principal approach uh, for this opening. So I didn't really think twice. I played a3, take, take, queen takes a3. And it's a pretty sharp position here. I mean, black has won a very healthy pawn, but in return, white has a dark squared bishop. White has potential um, to grab a big center with e4. Um, but this is the type of position that you should be playing for a win, not playing for a draw, of course. And uh, I had an opportunity to get a pretty nice um, game later on. I don't think these moves were necessarily perfect, but okay, they were quite normal. 
And uh, the critical moment was basically around here, where white definitely has some nice compensation, even though the fact that it seems like black has some very strong passers on the queen side, there's still a long way for moving, and the knight on e5 is strong, white has a lot of pressure. So here the right approach was to play quite aggressively with a move like e4, um, knight b6, and f4 and just starting to push pawns forward and, and just putting full pressure on black uh, on the king side. From here, white can try like bishop h4, f5, knight g4, just a lot of ideas. And actually, uh, objectively, white has a pretty serious uh, advantage here. Uh, at least Stockfish likes white's initiative quite a bit. So this is what was required of the position uh, to play uh, to play in a principled manner, but the way I played it was just kind of, uh, you know, wishy-washy. I just played bishop h4, black went a5, I played rook a1, and it just kind of a little bit too slow, just trying to keep things under control and hoping that the game was going to uh, resolve in my favor. Um, here my opponent found a strong liquidating move, knight to e4, um, threatening the, the queen on d2, and basically just trying to trade pieces and get himself into an endgame with a clear extra pawn. Uh, after bishop takes e4, queen takes h4, uh, I took on d5 here, bishop takes d5, and black just already had a pretty much a decisive advantage. Why it was out of compensation for the extra pawn, the bishop on d5 was just really strong, and while my knight on e5 looks nice, it, it was kind of an empty piece in this position, in that it doesn't really attack anything uh, concrete. So, unfortunately, I ended up losing this game, and, and so went, you know, my second chance to, uh, to clinch the final IM norm and get the IM title. Um, so moving on to the actual tournament where I got the norm, this was the uh, 2016 uh, St. Louis Autumn Invitational. I'll just show you guys the um, final results uh, that um, I got from this tournament. And um, as you can see, my tournament actually started off pretty well. So this was a round robin, so we all had our pairings uh, well ahead of time. I had played a couple of these round robins in St. Louis before. I'm, I'm always super happy with how they're um, organized. It's always just like the best conditions. They provide food for the players, refreshments. It's it's really, really just a pleasure to, to, <laughs> to play in St. Louis. And uh, I started off pretty well with um, three out of four, uh, including two wins, and a win over uh, one of the international masters in the tournament, Michael Brooks. Um, this was a, a pretty clean game on my end. Um, I then drew with uh, Lafong Hua, the, the chess bra. Shout out to Lafong, a good friend of mine. Uh, Matthew Larson, I defeated Doug Eckerd. This will be uh, the first game I present. And uh, then in round five, I actually lost to Josh Colas. Uh, and that game was a real bummer because I, I had a pretty nice advantage with White out of the opening. And I really thought I'm going to get another win and get to four points out of five. Um, six and a half out of nine was needed for the norm. Th this is one of the advantages of playing around Robin is that they tell you exactly how many points you need to score. Um, so I knew from the get-go six and, six and a half out of nine was, was my mission. Um, so I, I lost a pretty crucial game to Josh. And, and after that, um, I was on three points out of five, meaning I would need three and a half out of the last four rounds to actually make it to the norm. As you guys can see, you know, I did make it. Um, I, I first beat uh, Gary Shankar, an another friend of mine. That was uh, quite a tough game. Uh, then against uh, international master Vitaly Niemer, uh, we ended up drawing this game, but this was another game where I had a big advantage and I was winning. And uh, I really thought I was just going to go two out of two, and then I would only need one and a half out of two in my final two rounds. Uh, but unfortunately, I screwed it up and ended up uh, making a draw. And uh, it's always very tough, though, when, when you know you need a certain big score. So in this case, I needed three and a half out of my last four games. Um, the advice I would offer is just not to think about the score as much as you can and just take it game by game. Um, you basically just need to get lucky. You know, if you need three out of three, four out of four, there's no way to just force that. You know, your opponents need to help you out a little bit. Um, and you need to be, of course, on point and, and taking advantage of their mistakes. Um, after that draw, I need a two out of two in the final two rounds. Uh, of course, it seemed uh, doable. I wasn't playing like the strongest players ever or something. Um, but when there is that much pressure on you in the final two rounds, it's always uh, tough. So going to um, some of the games from this tournament, the first game I want to show is against uh, Doug Eckert, and I'll jump to the moment um, that I thought was uh, pretty critical here. Um, after White's 20th move, bishop to d3. Uh, so this was another King's Indian. Uh, in fact, the, the King's Indian defense is probably the opening that helped me get the IM title the most. Um, it's an opening I, I had picked up just recently at the time of this tournament, you know, maybe just the previous year. 
and uh, really kind of reinvigorated my chess. Um, by the way, I'll be doing another video specifically on the things that helped me improve my chess and, and reach that level where I could start fighting for IM norms and learning the King's Indian defense was absolutely one of those things. Um, so here I was actually already pretty happy with my position, um, but White's last move was pretty sensible, trying to trade off the light squared bishops and leaving black with some potential light square weaknesses uh, on the king side. But I correctly realized that I should actually not be afraid of this trade as long as the rest of my pieces stay active. So I played queen f6, bishop takes g6, queen takes g6, with the idea that now my queen is the one that's kind of uh, controlling the light squares. And we're left with this resulting position with bishop versus knight, where I just felt like my dark sword bishop is an absolute monster here. Uh, just dominating both sides of the board is completely untouchable, uh, defended. The f4 square is under my control as well, and so there's very little white can do about this uh, powerful bishop. Um, white played g3, I think just trying to uh, fight for some dark squares. And I actually really like the way I played this position. I played rook a b8, uh, seemingly intending b5, which is definitely a, a nice plan for black in this type of, you know, Benoni type structure. Um, white played queen e2, stopping this move, uh, and then I played rook b e8. This is actually the move I wanted to play. I wanted my rook on the e-file, but I figure if I can induce white to first play queen to e2, then when I play rook e8, I can get another tempo, uh, forcing white to move the queen away. Um, he ends up going queen to d2, uh, which was definitely expected. Like He doesn't want to go back to d1. That seems passive. But after queen d2, the queen is no longer on this diagonal, and that allows me to play h5. Um, once I realized I, I have this idea, I actually felt very, very excited about my position. Because now I'm opening up the h file, and because I'm able to dominate the center, uh, the attack on the king side is actually very hard to deal with. So white takes on h5, queen takes h5, um, rook a e1, and here I just go rook e7. So I'm kind of telegraphing my intentions here to play rook h7, but it's kind of too late for white to do anything about it. Uh, he tried knight e4, attacking the g5 pawn. I played rook to f5, simply shutting things down, defending it. Um, and then after f3, um, otherwise rook h7 or queen f3 is coming with a mating attack. After f3, bishop d4 check, king g2, rook h7. Uh, white simply resigned here because the only way to deal with the threat is rook h1, but that would allow queen takes f3 mate, and so the game is just over. Um, so I was pretty happy to win this game. After this, I lost that key game to Colas, and uh, then I just had to start rattling off uh, victories in, in the last couple of rounds. Um, jumping to the um, eighth round against uh, Seth Homa, um, I, I believe this was one of my, my best games of the tournament, probably one of the best games I've ever played. Um, I'll just start from uh, this moment here. So in this game, I was I was playing white, and, and already we have a couple of imbalances. Uh, the opening was a, kind of like a Shigorin defense um, that I think took place from a Queen's Gambit accepted move order. Just to show you guys real quick, it was d4, d5, c4, takes, e4, knight, c6, and it's basically just transposed into a Shigorin type of position. Um, so here, after bishop a5, I realized, okay, it was now time to make a decision uh, about my king. And I played the move rook g1, basically intending to castle queenside. Um, this is, of course, a very flexible move, just putting the rook on the open file against black's king, uh, threatening potential ideas of bishop h6. Uh, and black decided to react to this with knight h5. Now, this is actually a pretty thematic move for this type of position, because black is uh, trying to control some dark squares, opening up the queen to go to uh, h4. Um, getting ready to soon play g6 and support the knight. But with the bishop kind of stranded on a5, black's um, position here is, isn't just, it just isn't harmonious enough. Um, instead, what black should have done was fight for the center with e5. Um, then I would have probably played d5, knight e7, castles, and I think white is slightly better, but it's not like a huge advantage. Of course, the game would be very, very complicated. Um, but he goes knight h5, I decide to play rook g5, I thought this was a strong move. Not only am I attacking the knight, I'm also putting pressure on the bishop, and potentially threatening things like d5, and I'm blocking black's queen from being able to activate itself with queen h4. So he goes g6, I castle queenside, uh, bishop to b6, uh, and here I decided to play e5. A pretty committal move, but I think this was a very important attacking move, and my idea is to bring my knight to e4 and eventually fight for the f6 square, setting up exchange sacrifices with rook takes h5. Um, here black played knight e7, and uh, allowing me to sacrifice on h5. 
How do you play something like knight g7 though, like avoiding the sacrifice? Uh, to me it looked pretty good, I was going to play knight e4, and one line I, I was already calculating in the game was that in case of something like knight f5, knight f6 check, king g7, I could play rook takes f5, sacrificing the exchange this way, and then after e takes f5, strong move queen to f1, um, the queen is headed to h3, and black is going to have very, very serious problems uh, defending the king side here. I think the position is just lost. Black just doesn't have uh, enough defensive resources. Um, okay, so he goes 97, but this allows me to just take on h5 immediately, take, and uh, I think my initial instinct was knight to e4, but I decided to start with bishop g5 first. This just made more sense to create this pin, and now one of my pieces is going to be landing on the f6 square, either the bishop or the knight. Um, Black played queen d7, bishop f6, rook fd8, and here I actually just basically calculated it out till checkmate. It's actually not that long of a line, it's only a five move mate because uh, things are just, just very, very forced. Um, but I was I was pretty excited when I found the, the winning line because suddenly I realized after this I would only need to win one more game to actually get the title. Um, so queen e3, threatening of course uh, to play queen h6 and just mate black on the spot. And the thing is, is that this knight can jump to f5 and defend the g7 square, but then it wouldn't be able to defend against our rook g1 check. So the knight can either defend from g6 or from f5, but it cannot defend from both squares. Uh, so black plays queen e8, trying to put the queen on f8. Uh, basically, I expected this move. Queen h6, queen f8. Uh, but then after rook g1, it's basically over. Knight g6, and now the final combination. I uh, was very, very excited about being able to play this over the board. Rook takes g6. Uh, really just a fantastic move. The idea is, of course, if hg, I'm going to have checkmate on h8. And after f takes g6 is in the game, bishop takes e6 check, um, black's king just ends up mated. Uh, now, Seth was actually very, very gracious here. He ended up playing queen f7 on the board and uh, allowing me to checkmate him in this way. This is one of the prettier checkmates I've had the pleasure of uh, actually playing in a real tournament. And so I, I was definitely grateful to him for, for not resigning and actually letting me you know, crown my achievement with a, a win in style. So this left me with um, basically one game to go. And in the final game, I was uh, playing international master Angelo Young. Um, and uh, yeah, this was a really tough game, of course, because I was uh, playing black in this game and I needed to win to get the norm. Uh, and of course, my opponent also knew that I needed to win to get the norm. So uh, this, he certainly had the psychological advantage of playing white. You know, he, he doesn't have to take a lot of risk. He knows I'm going to have to try to uh, create chances. Um, so truth be told, I was completely outplayed in this game. Um, after the opening moves... Um, e3, castles, bishop e2. I played a pretty slow move, b6, um, allowing my opponent to play knight to e5, and then after bishop b7, h4, already white was developing just a really strong attack here, threatening to play h5 next. If I play h5 myself, I'm of course going to have to contend with the move g4, where my king side is just getting uh, ripped apart. But I managed to defend here uh, quite successfully. So uh, I play knight fd7, h5, uh, knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, knight d7. Um, he trades bishops, king takes f4. <laughs> I was feeling very, very concerned <laughs> about my position at this point because I just have this awful bishop on b7. My king is under pressure. Um, so I actually stopped thinking about trying to win the game, which which I think was to my benefit. And I just realized, okay, I'm just going to lose, you know, if, if I keep playing like this. So all I did was just try to play solid um, e6. He plays this interesting idea, bishop b5, inducing c6, pulling back. I play c5, just trying to get any counterplay whatsoever. Uh, queen f3, and then I decided to play f5, uh, shutting down the bishop on d3, just trying to fight for more space. Um, now he goes hd6, hd6, g4, knight f6, g5, I play knight e4, and uh, he plays natural move rook h6, which is actually, it turns out to be a mistake. Um, what he should have done was just give up the bishop for the knight, then after de4, queen g2, uh, basically just has good knight against bad bishop, he has ideas of um, playing knight b5 and trying to bring the knight to d4. If c takes d4, white has a very important move, castles queen side, where white is going to be able to win back the d4 pawn, and my king is going to be really weak, the dark squares are weak. Basically, black's position is, is pretty bad. Um, but he goes rook h6, allowing me to trade on c3. I guess he decided it was more useful to keep the light square bishop on the board, so now he has good bishop versus bad bishop. Um, but white's light square bishop is also hard to 
make use of here uh, because it's kind of biting on granite. So white's only chances is just to try to sacrifice this bishop somewhere. Um, here I played rook h8, just fighting for the h file, queen h3. Uh, I took on d4, e takes d4, and queen c7. I, I was actually pretty happy with what I calculated here um, because I'm attacking a lot of pawns. White goes king e2, so avoiding queen takes e3. Uh, check and preparing uh, rook h1 here where white is just gonna uh, threaten rook h7 and and basically win um, but I have rook g 8 uh, rook h1 and rook takes h6 I basically realized this was playable for black um, now the point is after queen takes h6 king to f7 white simply just doesn't have a great way to continue the attack and of course black is starting a bunch of counterplay with queen takes f4 queen c3 and so on so instead white play g takes h6, but now after king h7, uh, my king is surprisingly safe behind this white pawn, um, queen h4, queen d8, and if white goes for this endgame, I actually don't think white has such a such a huge edge here. I think even though black's position is really passive, white also has some weaknesses, and it's not so easy to, to play their position. Um, so my opponent agrees, he plays queen g5, uh, offering a trade on his own terms. Now if I take fg, then this endgame seems pretty sad for black because uh, of course white has this protected passer and the king now has been uh, granted just a free access into my position on the dark squares so this I think would just be strategically lost um, so of course I avoid the queen trade and I actually don't remember where but somewhere around here uh, I ended up offering a draw to my opponent and this is basically the only time I've offered some kind of like strategic draw to like try to mess with my opponent but <laughs> the basic psychology was this uh, of course, we both knew that I needed to win to get the norm. So obviously, I'm, I'm playing for the win. But we also both understood that if anyone is playing for the win here, um, it's white. Now, I didn't think white's advantage was that big, but it was very clear to me that I have no chance of winning this game unless my opponent does something crazy, messes up, blunders. Um, you know, Basically, if he takes control over the position and just doesn't give me any chances, I might not lose, but I'm never going to win this game aside from uh, some kind of blunder. So... By offering a draw, I was basically provoking my opponent to play for a win. Because if he wants to draw, well, he can take the draw. At this point, I had kind of given up on winning the game because I just thought like, okay, my position is bad. I'll be lucky to draw the game. So a draw is still a good result. I'll have more chances in the future to get the norm, you know, whatever. Um, but if he rejects the draw, which of course he ends up doing, then he's kind of put under this pressure to now play for the win at all costs because he rejected a draw, so now he has to play for the win. I don't know if this is such a great approach to, to the game of chess. Like, you know, like Fisher said, he doesn't believe in psychology, he believes in good moves. But in this game, I, I think it did help me because it did kind of put pressure on my opponent. He started spending more time, started playing more aggressively. And uh, at this point, he basically just starts maneuvering around quite a bit. Um, just trying to probe around, looking to create new weaknesses. And um, about 10, 12 moves later in this position, after uh, basically not much has changed, he, he ends up going for it. And we both had a few minutes left on our clock here. Uh, and in this position, after queen to f8, um, he plays the move bishop takes b5. Sacrificing the bishop so that once my bishop takes back, he's able to take this pawn on g6. And this is a pretty interesting sacrifice because now white has won a second pawn and even grabs a third pawn with queen takes e6, threatening all kinds of stuff like queen e5 check and queen takes d5. But fortunately for me, I have this move rook to e8. And then after queen takes d5, queen takes h6, white actually doesn't have any good checks here and black is about to start some pretty serious counterplay. The threats are queen takes f4. Um, rook to e2 check. I mean, it's basically very, very dangerous for, for white's king. Um, so he finds the only move, queen to f3, covering the f4 pawn and threatening uh, rook h3. Uh, I played bishop c6 here. This was the only move, the only defense to rook h3. And uh, he should have actually just played rook h3 anyway, going for this end game where I think objectively things are, are about equal. Um, but instead he plays queen f2, keeping more pieces on the board. Um, and, and now black is actually better w with the, the piece. I mean, white has three pawns for the piece, but the three pawns aren't, they're not that strong. Um, in this position, black's bishop is much stronger. Uh, so I play rook g8. I, I thought it made sense to trade rooks. And uh, after a couple more moves, c4, bishop e4, 
Um, I At this point, I started playing for a win. I think he actually offered me a draw at some point around here, but of course I, I was well past the point of being willing to accept a draw. At this point I was, of course, again playing for a win, and uh, something uh, pretty strange actually happened. I played a4, king to c3, queen a6. This was not a good move, queen a6. What white should have done here uh, was play like queen h4 and uh, threaten all kinds of perpetual checks. Much better move actually was the move queen to h1, where... Um, my queen is threatening a lot of stuff like queen a1 check for example and, and white's king the pawns are all under heavy pressure the bishop on e4 is of course such a strong piece um, but in addition to all these threats i'm also having some defensive ideas with the queen on h1 uh, covering the h file and not allowing white's king uh, white's queen to to get active um, so i think black would have been winning had i found this i play queen a6 which which allows um which allows some some perpetual checks and and uh, potential draw and here my opponent was uh, essentially reaching for his king, um, trying to play king to b4 here. And uh, then when he had like maybe, we were both playing on the increment at this point. So he had like maybe five seconds when he was like reaching for the king. Then at the last second, this happened so often, he like noticed some detail, maybe queen b7 check. He, he like wasn't sure. He hesitated for a moment and all of a sudden he flagged. Uh, and that's how I won the game and, and got my final norm, uh, thanks to my opponent flagging in an objectively drawn position. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, did it feel great to win in this way? Not really, but that's kind of why I showed, you know, my, my failures before, because I ended up just getting lucky and uh, just getting the norm, you know, just based on my opponent flagging. But of course, you know, I played well in this tournament. I had to create some chances. It was pretty volatile. And in general, you know, you're, you're rarely going to be able to win a chess tournament or achieve some kind of huge achievement um, without a little bit of luck uh, on your side. And I think that's kind of an important part uh, of chess. Um, so yeah, obviously I was very happy after this game. Uh, in fact, this took place uh, the day before my 24th birthday. Uh, so, so that was a nice birthday present for myself. And um, because I had reached the 2400 threshold uh, much earlier, um, I was awarded the title almost immediately. And a few months later, as soon as it was ratified, uh, I had the, uh, the IM certificate. So that was pretty cool. Uh, all right, guys, uh, like I mentioned in the next video, uh, I'll be covering some of the steps I took to uh, improve my chess and become a stronger player overall. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a thumbs up. It really helps with the channel. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.